Good morning and welcome to Fairlawn Avenue United Church on this Everyday Saints, Unsung Heroes, and Ordinary Mystics Sunday in October as we discover and celebrate the ways an open and questioning faith can transform our living in the midst of the stark challenges of these days. This is a time to pause to tune into what God's Spirit is up to in the world, to listen, and to give thanks. It's good to gather, and I'm glad that you're here. Of course, our Director of Music, Eleanor Daly, has provided us with the Music Bulletin, alongside this service with music clips that remind us of why music is so important in our worship at Fairlawn. So scroll down below this video for that link. Your worship will not feel complete until that is a part of it as well. Here are some words of prayer to bring us into worship this day. God of life, we are grateful in these autumn days for life's goodness. Good things all around us, your love surrounding us, and a community of others with whom to share it. We gather, encircled by a cloud of witnesses, a beloved community with whom we join our voices, in commitment and with conviction and in hope, to share the feast of life. For saints who have lifted and inspired us in our lives, we give you thanks. For ordinary saints whose faithfulness lit our path and whose love warms our hearts still, we are grateful. Forgive us when we ignore the witness and wisdom of those who have gone before us. Raise us up and strengthen us and remind us that we are not alone. Amen. Our reader today is Heather McPherson. For many of us, the notion of All Saints Sunday is bound up in medieval-like notions about saints and miracles and superstitions. The reading from the Gospel of John helps to ground us more solidly in the reality of death, the possibility of a life that is more than what ends at death, and the depth of the relationships that we form with others in love. Jesus' friendship with the family that included Martha, Mary, and their brother Lazarus is deep and seems to have begun before Jesus had in any way begun to act on his sense of being called by God. These people knew him and loved him as a lifelong friend, and the death of Lazarus hits him hard. Whatever happens in this scene, Lazarus will, of course, die. Jesus' raising of Lazarus does not change that. However, we begin, we begin to glimpse in Jesus that there is something more to life that is beyond death and that is rooted in love and in the relationships that nurture love right here and now. Our reading is John 11 verses 32 through 44. When Mary arrived where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. When Jesus saw her crying and those who had come with her crying also, he was deeply disturbed and troubled. He asked, where have you lain him? They replied, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to cry. Some onlookers said, 
see how much he loved him. But some others said, he healed the eyes of the man born blind. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus was deeply disturbed again when he came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone covered the entrance. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said, Lord, the smell will be awful. He's been dead four days. Jesus replied, didn't I tell you that if you believe, you will see God's glory? So they removed the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. I know you always hear me. I say this for the benefit of the crowd standing here, so that they will believe that you sent me. Having said this, Jesus shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his feet bound and his hands tied, and his face covered with a cloth. Jesus said to them, untie him and let him go. In this reading, we hear God's voice. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Kate Bowler is 41 years old. She is a Canadian-born professor of the history of Christianity in North America at Duke University. She first came to notice as the author of Blessed, a history of the American prosperity gospel in 2013, and in 2018, the New York Times bestseller, Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies I've Loved. You see, in between, in 2015, age 35, she was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. In her most recent book, No Cure for Being Human and Other Truths I Need to Hear, published this year, Kate Bowler upends naive catchphrases like carpe diem, seize the day, and Y-O-L-O, -O, YOLO, you only live once, and the cultural phenomenon of bucket lists with incisive comments like, everybody pretends that you only die once, but that's not true. You can die to a thousand possible futures in the course of a single stupid life. For every cliche, Bowler encounters during her own stage serious journey. She offers an alternative. Rather than make a bucket list, she suggests in its place, a life is never finished even when it's over. Instead of the impossible to practice mantra, no regrets, Bowler wisely notes that facing the past is part of facing the future. In her interviews and articles and podcast appearances with Brené Brown, Kate Bowler offers people permission to negotiate suffering with an honesty that God's own suffering provides them. Because of her courage and her honesty, her humor and her faith, people call her a saint. But as one book reviewer, themselves under a diagnosis of incurable cancer, put it, as an antidote to those who offer the cold comfort of empty banalities, no cure for being human demonstrates the gift God has given the world by calling forth a people, a people, capable of being a community of care, a people whose convictions about God's abiding presence 
help us to know that our simple presence with those who suffer is an essential moral doing. It's about a community of saints, each contributing their peace to the living of life with a compassion and conviction that is capable of transforming the world. We struggle with how to talk about saints these days. We're a bit allergic to superstition and, truth be told, a little cynical. We sense hypocrisy. But we also yearn for people who embody something of such enduring value in life that it becomes inspiring. The living thoughts and values courage and actions of those around us, those before us, inevitably influence us and guide us, inspire us, and we seek out those touchstones. We sometimes prefer to talk about heroes, and I, I get that, but it is no less precarious, for heroes too turn out to have what were once referred to as tarnished halos. But rather than cynicism, we learn not to idolize individuals, but to develop a realistic ability to take what is good about people for what it can offer us by way of example, but not to require people to be unsullied in all the other parts of their life that need never be scrutinized in public. I think that's why, through the ages, when it comes to saints, the best, the best tradition of the church has not been in singling out saints individually, but rather being a part of a community of saints, plural. It's a collaborative pool of values and qualities, wisdom and spiritual formation to which we can all contribute and from which we all draw. It's a whole that is far greater than the sum of its parts. It's like there's a multiplier at work that surprises no one more than the saints themselves. So while the ancient creeds of the church speak of the communion of saints, the Gospel of John and the letters of John provide another, perhaps simpler, way of expressing it, the beloved community. It's rooted in the Gospel of John, where Jesus says, Love each other. Just as I have loved you, so you also must love each other. This is how everyone will know that you are my disciples when you love each other. And in the letter that we call 1 John, writing to an early church community, we love because God first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters, are liars. After all, those who don't love their brothers or sisters, whom they have seen, can hardly love God, whom they have not seen, we have this from Jesus. Those who claim to love God ought to love their brother and sister also. And it's there too in the story of Lazarus, where Jesus, Jesus' love becomes specific and intimate, personal, within a community of friends, risky and vulnerable. Through the centuries, the vision of the beloved community has been like a stone in the shoe of the church's preferred position of power in the world. Most recently, for Martin Luther King Jr., the image of the beloved community became a touchstone for his understanding of the kingdom of God, the fulfillment of God's vision of a world of 
justice and peace and reconciliation among peoples and religions. King's last book, it was written in 1967, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community, set out his understanding of the beloved community. The key for him is love. He wrote, when I speak of love, I am speaking of that force which all the great religions have seen as the supreme unifying principle of life. Love is the key that unlocks the door which, heads, which leads to ultimate reality. Our goal is to create a beloved community, and this will require a qualitative change in our souls as well as a quantitative change in our lives. A qualitative change in our souls as well as a quantitative change in our lives. In recent months, the United Church of Canada has been working toward a renewed mission and vision for our faith community in a turbulent world. The question came down to this. How might we unite around who we could be as beloved community? Deep, bold, daring, diverse, connected, hope-filled, and inspiring. Living the good news that continues to be born in our midst, even in these most perilous of times. The resulting vision statement that was approved just last weekend expresses the hope that living purposefully into this vision anticipates becoming what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and others called the beloved community, the ever inbreaking, ever transforming, ever reconciling realm of God realized in our time. The story of the raising of Lazarus is one of the most dramatic and difficult of the stories about Jesus told in the Bible. And I'll confess that I don't understand it. Apart from anything else, I don't understand why Jesus chooses to bring Lazarus back in the first place. Does a man who's been dead for four days even want to come back? I mean, he will only have to go through all that dying business all over again. And then Lazarus disappears from the story as soon as he emerges from the tomb, which is oddly anticlimactic. But the story also gives us one of the clearest glimpses of Jesus' humanity across the centuries in words that we can all understand. Jesus wept, or Jesus began to cry. It really is the heart of the story that for Jesus, and we might say by extension for God, Love of his friend who has died means that grief takes him and breaks him open. Jesus, our best glimpse into the heart of God, stands at the grave of his friend and weeps. His tears, in a way, legitimize our grief. Yes, we have a resurrection and Easter hope, but that doesn't cancel out love's essential work of grief. There is empathy in the heart of God. It is okay to yearn for life. It's okay to feel a sense of wrong, of injustice in the face of death. It's okay to mourn the loss of vitality, of intimacy with those we love here and now. And yet, if this is a story of transformation, this Lazarus story about rolling away stones from tombs and unbinding people from the grip of death, then lament and loss and grief cease being passive responses. 
In fact, they can mobilize our energy for hope, for life. What breaks our hearts can also galvanize our spirits and our determination to bring transformation and healing and justice to life in the place of death, as Jesus did. There's something of how we become the beloved community woven right into the story of Lazarus. It's there in people's comment, see how much he loved him. And in Jesus' words, speaking freedom and life, remove the stone and then unbind him. So, saints, ordinary people living in extraordinary times like this, and being drawn out in surprising ways to contribute gifts and strengths, wisdom, depths of compassion that maybe they had no idea existed within them, creating a beloved community. Rachel Held Evans is someone who many people unapologetically call a saint. As a recent profile in The New Yorker says, during an era when people are fleeing churches, especially white evangelical churches in the U.S., Rachel Held Evans is considered a, patr a patron saint. You see, it's no sudden secular turn in the U.S. People are leaving megachurches with praise bands and coffee bars, but not abandoning a belief in Jesus. As the New Yorker puts it, every generation needs dissenters. And Rachel was a sharp, faithful prophet in the midst of these disillusioned, earnest seekers. With humility and with openness, Held Evans, herself raised in a fundamentalist evangelical brand of Christianity, helped reintroduce a mode of spiritual inquiry that was based in seeking mystery, not certainty. She made Christianity seem like a decent place to be while you asked questions. Having grown up in Dayton, Tennessee, site of the famous Scopes trial about teaching evolution in schools in the 1920s, Held Evans' first book was titled Evolving in Monkey Town, how a girl who knew all the answers learned how to ask the questions. She followed it up in 2015, uh, in 2013, with A Year of Biblical Womanhood, how a liberated woman found herself sitting on her roof, covering her head and calling her husband master. And then in 2015, with Searching for Sunday, loving, leaving, and finding the church. She gave evangelicals permission to ask questions, to doubt, to emerge from the confines of U.S. evangelical Christianity and to find faith again. Posted by her writing desk was a sentence from one of her books. Even here in the dark, God is busy making all things new. Was, was posted. In April 2019, while speaking at a conference, she developed flu-like symptoms and her condition deteriorated rapidly. She was placed in a medically induced coma and subsequently died. Rachel Held Evans was 37 and left behind her a husband and two children, aged three and five. Hillary Clinton wrote, My prayers go out to everyone grieving the tragic loss of Rachel. She lived a life of generosity, justice-seeking, and inclusive faith. So many people were touched by her voice and her example. What a life and what a legacy. 
Lin-Manuel Miranda, the creator of Hamilton, tweeted that he was reading Rachel Held Evans' last book, Inspired, Slaying Giants, Walking on Water, and Loving the Bible Again. In Held Evans' own words, much as I prefer the self-protection offered by cynicism, caution, and carbohydrates, finding my way back to my own belovedness has required receiving a new spirit, one of tenderness and one of vulnerability. In her final writings, in a book that was published posthumously just this week, titled simply Wholehearted Faith, in explicit reference, reference to one of Brene Brown's favorite words, Rachel Held Evans again and again circles back to the notion of belovedness, a vision of the church as it could be, as it needs to return to being a freeing, transforming community of love. In the places in life where faith and the spirit are nurtured, private places, public places, there is an echo. It takes our voices, our whispers, our shouts, and gives them resonance and depth. The places of the spirit in our world reverberate with sound as though filled with a multitude of voices, though we may believe that we are alone there. On All Saints Day, all saints, together, we recognize that we are not alone, that we are accompanied in life. This is no solo pilgrimage. May it be so. Amen. Our music today is Pia Yesu from French composer Gabriel Faure's Requiem. It's sung by Fairlawn Soprano section lead Amy Doddington. The Latin words in English are Merciful Jesus, Lord, grant them rest. Grant them rest, eternal rest.
now I invite you to join me as we remember together the faces and names of the saints among us who have died in the course of the past year in this pandemic time, whose lives we have been unable to gather and to celebrate as we would normally and naturally. They are remembered and they are loved as are those who grieve them. For more information and to see these and previous entries in our online Fairlawn Remembers album, you can go to our website, www.fairlawnchurch, all one word, fairlawnchurch.ca, and click on the In Memoriam tab at the top of the page, top right. The website's also a good place to keep up on everything that's happening at Fairlawn online and now in person. Ministry that continues to be supported by your financial contributions as well, which we need and greatly appreciate as we work to fulfill Fairlawn's mission through interesting times. As you'll be aware, alongside this online worship service, Fairlawn Avenue United Church also offers the option of a modified in-person worship service in the sanctuary for those who have pre-registered and who observe our public health guidelines. For those of you who have found us virtually and who for whatever reason are unlikely to join in an in-person gathering at the church, I would be glad for the opportunity to get to know you. We won't pester you with emails or anything, but if you would send me a note to say hi, to tell me a little bit about yourself, I'm, I'm really interested in the human face of our online community. If you can send a note to me, please do at Ducharme, D-U-C-H-A-R-M-E, Ducharme, at Fairlawn Avenue United, all one word, fairlawnavenueunited.ca. Now I invite you to join our spirits and hearts together in prayer. 
the earth turns and leaves fall, God of love, we reach back and we reach out to recognize and to renew the community that connects us with one another and with you and with the saints of our lives. With hearts and hands open, we hold on to love, love that is stronger than death. We acknowledge those who once dwelled among us, who knew us well, who taught us, who sometimes hurt us, who loved us. They touch our lives still. Through their presence and their absence, they are a part of us, touchstones of our living now. Without fear, with thanksgiving and with hope for all that awaits, we are grateful for the community of hope and renewal that we form together. This week, the world gathers in Glasgow for the UN Climate Change Conference, COP26. With them and for the world, its wonders and its wounds, we pray. We acknowledge the responsibility we have for life on this fragile planet. We pray that the political leaders at COP26 will have the foresight and the courage to embrace the changes that will be needed to foster a more sustainable society to implement fairer solutions for the poorest and the most vulnerable, and that all of us will commit to the changes that we need to make for the life of this, our common home. For the aches and the joys of this community of people, we pray. For those who carry pain, who are hurting, who are grieving. For those who are angry or lonely or frightened, including people near us, facing struggles and difficulties we may be unaware of. Hear our prayers for those we hold close in our hearts as we keep silence. We pray in the name of Jesus, whose words and whose way fills this world with life. Amen. I hope you've taken a moment to click open this week's greetings newsletter to learn some insightful things about hibernating bears, among other things, and to get an update on things at Fairlawn, to check out some of the things that you can be a part of, things that you might want to pass on to others. Our website's also a good place to help keep connected. A reminder once again that Coffee Chat has moved to a new time in the afternoon to enable those who are at the in-person service to be able to participate too. And you will want to be a part of it today for some important news from Governing Council that will be shared. So Coffee Chat or Afternoon Chat or I've spent all afternoon out raking leaves and I've earned a glass of wine chat will take place beginning at 4.15 p.m. to 5 p.m. The format and the process for logging on to Zoom is, as usual, in the notice for this morning's online worship. I hope you'll join us for some spirited conversation. Now, as we go, let us bless one another, all of us, the saints, that we come together to form a community of love. We go on our way rejoicing as part of a beloved community with others, saints and seekers. In whatever good we are able to do, may we precede it with hope, accompany it with prayer, and follow it with gratitude. We go in peace as a community of saints, each one loved by God. Go in peace and hope. Amen.